All right, well, I'd like to read for you our text uh, this evening, which is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And uh, as there is quite a bit in here, we're only going to touch on, um, we'll try to touch on each part of it, but not go into a great deal of depth, depth but just to get the, the overall picture of what's going on here, what we were before Christ and what we are now uh, in Christ, and, and see this as kind of an exposition of what Paul was referring to this morning in, in Romans chapter um, 15. So Paul writes this, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and a so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God, in the spirit. Oh, may the Lord bless his uh, word to our, uh, our, our growth in grace uh, this evening. Now this morning, remember, Paul prayed that God would give to us the grace of patience and encouragement through Jesus' example to love and to accept each other. Again, coming from a variety of uh, backgrounds, but remembering that as Christ has accepted us, we need to accept one another. Now, Jesus fulfilled God's promises to the Jews that he might become the way of reconciliation for all men to God. And having become this, he received his, his elect from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, from us, who are so different in every way from the Jews. And, and the point is, of course, that if Jesus could receive the Gentiles who were so far from him, uh, we can receive one another. So that together, as we receive one another, as we love one another, as those divisions are broken down, we might be the witness that God desires to the world of the gospel's power to heal division. The fact that the church is so divided today and again, as we mentioned this morning, fragmented, uh, not just between East and West, you know, in 1054, uh, the early church, but, and not just the Protestant Reformation. And that actually, as I said before this morning, was a good division. But how the true church has been fragmented into so many different denominations. And there is some degree of, of you know, division uh, between them uh, as far as how we look at one another and how we, uh, how we you know, treat one another, uh, that injures Christ's cause. And so he prays for us, even now from heaven, as he did in the high priestly prayer, and he exhorts us through his word to pray and to work towards unity. Now, I think this is easier to do when we remember what the Lord has done for us. Okay, how he has shown mercy to us. I think sometimes we forget uh, 
what we were. Maybe some, maybe we haven't really fully come to understand what we were. Uh, I think um, Paul, uh, he realized that, you know, before he came to Christ, uh, actually when he came to Christ, that his works were a mountain of, of refuse, you know, that, that didn't please the Lord at all. But it seemed as, as, as the Apostle Paul grew in his sanctification, he became more and more aware of what he was before he came to Christ. And I think the same thing is true with us. But often we do forget what that condition was when we came into the world. We didn't come into the world as we are now, on our way to heaven by God's grace. But we came into the world lost and on our way to eternal punishment, like the Gentiles Paul is speaking of in our passage. Now, it may be true that our experience may have been more like the Jews. You know, here's, here's where we have to make a little bit of a distinction. If we were raised in a Christian household where we heard the gospel and we heard God's promises and they were extended to us every day as we encouraged or we were encouraged as children to put our trust and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our experience may have been more like the Jews, but we do need to remember with very, very few exceptions, even if we were raised in a Christian household, we still came into this world on our way to judgment until the Lord actually saved us. So in either case, whether we were raised in Christian households or we weren't, we were still strangers to the grace of God until He had mercy on us. And that's really what Paul is wanting to emphasize here to the Ephesians, to these Gentile believers, what they were before Christ and the mercy God has shown to them. So let's first of all reflect upon what Paul says here. Uh, what we were before Christ, and I think it's reflected in that one word, you know, what the Jews were calling the Gentiles, uncircumcised. Now, in this letter, again, he's speaking to those who had just been brought to salvation from a completely pagan background. You know, th these are not Gentiles who were raised in Christian households. Now, as I noted before, that may not have been our experience. We may have been raised in a Christian household, and again, our experience may have been more like the Jews who had the light of the gospel. But for our purposes this evening, let's just remember that being Gentiles, okay, we are all Gentiles, there was a time when what Paul said was true of, of our descendants, right, outside of Christ, who were without God and without hope, and so we would have been, uh, apart from His grace uh, as well. And so let's consider it ourselves from that perspective. And again, I think even if we were raised in a Christian household, being children of wrath in a Christian household, I mean, that is possible. It, I mean, that, that's, that's the reality of us. Uh, even though, you know, in Scripture we may be represented as holy, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 7, that holiness only refers to our being separated to God in a certain sense, separated from the world and included in those, you know, in the church in the sense that we're among those who are professing, professing faith in Christ. We belong to God. He is our God, and He's going to be working in our lives, and that's certainly true. But that holiness does not mean that we are sanctified and saved and on our way to heaven until we reach some sort of an age of accountability, okay? We are still the children of wrath as long as we are outside of Christ. So let's can just consider ourselves as being uncircumcised, uncircumcised of heart, like the Gentiles who were uncircumcised. We were separated from God's people, from the Jews. Let's not forget God gave them circumcision as a sign of His covenant with them. Now, again, the same was true of the Jews. Neither the covenant that God made with them nor the circumcision that He gave to them guaranteed their salvation. They were still lost until they trusted in Christ. But it preached the gospel to them. Okay? It was a, a blessing to them. It was a sign of God's covenant on them that they were a holy people, even though mainly unconverted. But it also pointed them to their need of the circumcision of the heart, which only the Spirit of God can give. 
and which he only gives in Christ. And remember, God had given them enough light in the Old Covenant to find Christ, okay? So it was revealed to them where the Gentiles were in absolute darkness. That circumcision was also a seal of God's promises to them that if they met the conditions of faith and repentance, if they only trusted in Jesus and turned from their sins, which they could only do through this change of heart that comes from the Holy Spirit, that circumcision of the heart, He would give them what was promised, forgiveness and eternal life. Those were the privileges given to the Jews. Okay? They had the light. They had circumcision. They had God's covenants. They had all these things. But He didn't give that to the Gentiles. He didn't give that to the nations. He did not give that to us. We were not circumcised because He didn't make this covenant with our forefathers. We did have a covenant. We were in a covenant with God, but that's the covenant that Adam broke, okay? The covenant of works. And being in that covenant, we were under the consequences of that broken covenant which is the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. We were under the sentence of death and eternal misery. So what does that look like? Well, Paul describes it here. He says we were separate from Christ. Okay? Christ is the only source of forgiveness. Christ is the only way of salvation and can only be found among God's covenant people. And he had only made that covenant with the Jews. We are excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, from citizenship with God's people. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. Paul talks about in the book of Romans what a great blessing the Jews had bestowed on them, that they were the children of the covenant, that God had made the covenant with their forefathers, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He had made the, that covenant with them, the Mosaic covenant with them, the new covenant he had promised to them, the Davidic covenant that promised the king. All of these covenants were made with them. Okay? We were strangers to those covenants. We, we received no benefit from those at all. And that was obvious, made obvious by the fact that we did not have the sign of the covenant in us. We were uncircumcised. So the bottom line is we were without hope, at least none that we were aware of. Okay? You know, it's interesting, the Gentiles who were without hope at that time did actually have hope, but it was prophesied in the Scriptures and they were totally unaware of it. The Scriptures that we were reading about this morning where God had promised that a time was coming when He would show mercy on them when he would show mercy on us, but being completely ignorant of that, they were without hope. They certainly had no hope of salvation, no hope of being freed from their guilt. They and we were without God in this world. Okay, so we knew he existed from what we see around us, and again, we, we know about that from apologetics. And as R.C. reminded us, that most people do understand. They see that God exists. But if they were honest with themselves, and if we were honest with ourselves, the only thing that we knew that we could expect from this God who exists is judgment. Because God has given to us a conscience. And that conscience shows us a couple of things. It shows us that He is good and that we're not. Because this conscience makes us, again, feel good when we do what's good. It shows us that God approves of what is good. It makes us feel bad when we do what's bad. It shows us that God does not approve of sin and what is bad. But it also shows us that His being good and our being guilty, that all we could really expect from Him was judgment. So this was our condition coming into the world. We deserve damnation. We knew that we deserved damnation. We knew that there was nothing we could do about it. You know, you can actually deduce these things from what God reveals in, in creation. And I think that everyone knows that. If they can't articulate it, if they can't explain it, they sense it, they know it, they have some understanding of it, and so did we.
we also understood that there was nothing we could do to change our, our situation, our condition at all. That we, there was no way that we could compel God to show us mercy. And even if God had offered it to us, we knew that we could not receive it because we didn't want it. We knew that we hated God. That's why we always did the things that were displeasing to Him and continued to sin against Him. As Paul reminds us earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, we were the children of God's wrath. Children of wrath means that we were born for destruction. And we were going the way the rest of the world was going, marching on the broad road to destruction, and we would have ended up in hell, okay? That is, is the truth about where we came from. And that was true of every one of us here this evening. We need to understand that is what we deserved and would have received it apart from Christ. But as Paul tells us in our text, God in His infinite mercy his infinite love showed us mercy through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He has brought us near. Now, we saw this morning how Jesus, remember, reconciled both Jew and Gentile through his suffering and how we are to receive each other because of this. Well, here Paul is going to tell us the same thing, but he gives us a little bit more detail about what He has done for us, what He has done to make both into one or reconcile both in, in one body, that is, in His body, okay? He says, first of all, that Jesus has become our peace. You know how we, we referred this morning to the fact that when Jesus was born, the angels, you know, were, were singing, you know, peace on earth, that His is a kingdom of peace. He has come to bring peace among those with whom He is pleased. He brings peace to His elect. He reconciles them. That's why He came into the world, to bring peace between us and God, and to bring peace between Jew and Gentile, and to bring peace between the members of His, of his body. Now, Paul says He did this, especially between the Jew and the Gentile, between God's covenant people and us, by breaking down the barrier or the dividing wall. Now, he's referring here, I think, to the wall that divided the court of the Gentiles in the temple where the God-fearing Gentiles who were not full proselytes, they believed in the God of Israel, that He was the true God. But for some reason, they did not want to be circumcised. They did not want to become full proselytes. So there was a place for them. If you look at the diagram of the temple, you'll see that that there's the outer wall, and then immediately on the inside of the wall, there's this court of the Gentiles that extends all the way around. And that's as far as the Gentiles could go to worship God. And from there, only true Jews were allowed to enter. And Paul is telling us that that wall symbolized the fact that the Gentiles were not God's people. They were still separated from Him. But Jesus broke down this barrier, he says in verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now, I think it's perfectly clear what Paul is saying here, isn't it? Actually, it, it, it isn't, but um, there are differing opinions on, on what he's talking about here. Uh, some, and I, you know, I heard this explained in, in um, evan some evangelical churches I was a part of, that, that what Jesus did was when He died on the cross, He fulfilled the moral law and He abolished the moral law, and that somehow the moral law was what was keeping us apart from one another. And you know, there's a certain sense in which there's some truth to that because the Jews were, were very careful in trying to keep that law, and they looked at the Gentiles as lawbreakers, and as long as, you know, they saw themselves as the holy people, the obedient people, they would despise those who were not obedient, but does getting rid of the standard really help the situation, you know? I mean, how could that reconcile us? The moral law was given to us to tell us how to love and how to receive each other. This is how Jesus loved us. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that until 
heaven and earth pass away, nothing is going to pass away from the moral law until the world passes away. And I think he is referring specifically in that passage to the moral law because then he goes on to expound the moral law. And he talks about how the Jewish teachers were teaching God's people to break that law and how he elevated it back to the place where it should be. And he says, this is what you need to keep and this is what you need to teach. This is how we are to love one another. And Jeremiah also tells us that the blessing of the new covenant is that the Spirit of God writes this law on our hearts so that we can obey it. Paul is not saying the moral law separated us. It may have shown us what it is that was separating us, but it did not separate us. Now, another possibility is that Paul here is referring to the ceremonial and separation laws, okay? separation laws in particular were specifically meant to keep the Jew and the Gentile apart. God wanted His people, the Jews, to be separate from the world, and no surprise there because the world was evil, although God's people often became evil and became indistinguishable from the world. But He intended them to be a holy people and to walk according to His ways while the rest of the world was in darkness and immoral and wicked. God did not want them to intermingle. And so he gave them a series of laws to teach them to remain separate. And even today, the Lord tells us as believers that we need to be careful to keep ourselves separate in a certain sense, such as not marrying unbelievers. God did not want the, the Jew to marry Gentiles. And now in the new covenant, he doesn't want Christians to marry non-Christians, which is kind of the same distinction. So... He could be referring here to removing those laws, but, but again, um, we can't say he's done that absolutely, right? Because we still can't intermarry with, with unbelievers. So more likely, I think Paul here is referring to the, the enmity or the hatred that the moral law stirred up in the heart of the Jew against the Gentile and the Gentile also against the Jew, the hatred that it stirs up towards God and our neighbor. Now, that, that's kind of interesting to say that the moral law does that because the moral law is supposed to teach us how to love. But Paul did tell us, remember earlier in Romans, that even though it tells us how to love, it can't make us love. It can't give us the power to love. But it does have the power to stir up the hatred the sin that is in our hearts. And it's this moral law that was stirring up the hatred between the Jew and the Gentile. Okay? They hated each other because of sin that was made evident by the law. So by dying on the cross, Jesus, he not only canceled out our guilt and reconciled us to God, but he also broke the power of sin in our hearts, giving us love in its place so that he might reconcile us to each other. He's taken away the enmity or the hatred through the cross by giving us his Holy Spirit so that we would love one another. Paul says that he's brought us both into one body. We're no longer two groups, but now we are one new man. Think about that in terms of dispensational thinking, right? God has two peoples, Jews, church. But here, Paul is saying there aren't two groups anymore, but there is one group that simply moves forward. And this one group, as we're going to see, are those who are participating and receiving the blessings of the promises and the covenants that God made with Israel. But he's brought both groups into one body, his body. And now that we are members of the same body, now that we are Family, now that we are one people, there is peace between us. And in doing this, he is fulfilled, as Paul quotes in verse 17, Isaiah 57, verse 19. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, to you Gentiles, to me Gentile, and peace to those who were near to the Jews. And he says, now that we're in Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Notice the, the emphasis on unity, right? Uh, 
We're all one body. We're all one family. We all have access in one spirit to the one Father. We are all one people of God, one family of God. We are all His children. We all have the same rights and privileges. We can all call God our Father. And we can all come to Him at any time and ask whatever we want according to His will in the name of the one mediator. And He promises that He will hear and answer us. And so Paul's conclusion is, is this. Through the work of Christ, we're no longer strangers, okay? No longer strangers to God's covenants of promise. I still remember quite clearly my professor in college saying, the church has nothing, has, has no interest in the covenants God made with Israel. They're for Israel only, okay? Well, no. The Gentiles, along with the Jews, being reconciled to God in Christ, were no longer strangers to God's covenants, we now receive the promises of God. We, we are partakers of the same, you know, the same root, as it were, the, the, you know, the root of the, the olive tree we saw in Romans chapter 11. We, we are the recipients of the blessings of these covenants that God made with Israel. The promises He made to Israel are now ours in Christ, no longer strangers. We're no longer alienated from God, no longer without hope in this world. Um, you know, before we were looking forward only to judgment, but now we have the hope of heaven. And Paul says we are fellow citizens with the saints, and the saints being the elect Jews and members of his household. He goes on to say that we're a part of the true temple of God. Remember, we just we sang that hymn. It seemed like it might have been familiar to, to some of us. We haven't sung it in a while. But... The true temple of God, which is made of living stones, the spiritual temple, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, their teaching and, and you know, prophetic ministry, with Christ who is the cornerstone because it's His work that is the foundation that makes the temple possible. And in Him, we're being built together into one holy temple where God is pleased to dwell by His Holy Spirit. You know, we don't have to come together before the Spirit is here. If we are trusting in Christ, the Spirit dwells in us wherever we go, but we are all one holy temple, and that refers to the whole church scattered throughout all the different denominations in all places of the world. God dwells in us by His Holy Spirit. So these are the privileges and the blessings that are ours now in the Lord Jesus Christ. We were the children of wrath on our way to destruction, but through Christ, we who had no hope now have this wonderful hope. So putting together what we saw this morning and now what we've seen this evening, what Paul is saying to us is this, is God has shown us this infinite mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ by bringing us from a state of hopelessness to hopefulness from the citizens of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, from being the children of the devil to the children of God, we are now called to show mercy to others, to love and accept each other in spite of our differences, so that we, with one mind towards each other, one heart, and with one voice, may show the world the reality of God's love for us in Christ so that seeing this love, others may find their way to God. Now again, if we understand this, if we understand the mercy that God has shown us, it'll go a long ways in helping us to show mercy to others. And so may the Lord help us, as, as we saw, now this was on Thursday, okay, as we had our congregational meeting, um, just that devotional based upon the seed sower, how there's the four different responses to the Word of God. It doesn't apply just to evangelism. You know, that applies to every time we get together and the Word of God is being read and preached, there's, there's a question of how we're going to respond to it, right? Is it just going to be wiped away by the enemy as a seed sown by the path? Is it going to be, you know, I'm going to accept it until things get hard, then I'm just going to reject it, and, 
do what I want, like the seed that's sown among the rocky soil? Is, is the world going to choke out the fruitfulness of the word, you know, so that as I'm influenced by the world, I'm, I'm still going to tend more towards, you know, don't get mad, but get even? Or am I going to take this word into my heart and hold on to it and bear fruit with perseverance? Well, that, that's what we need to do with, with everything the Lord tells us. So may the Lord grant to us that we may take this word deeply into our hearts and bear the fruit that he desires from us so that there might be unity uh, among his people. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do this.